Okay, so we're going to uh, read what is, or we, we're going to discuss, I hope you'll tell me what well you have read, the introduction uh, to a book that John uh, uh, Yang wrote uh, about, he uh, wrote it in about uh, 2009, but it took a long time to be translated into English, so far as 2014. It's available free on the internet. You can't make a copy. Uh, if you download it, you'll, you, might, you might not be able to read it, but you can read it online. Uh, so, <coughs> that, uh, uh, well, this is Kip Thurman in here. At some point, I um, need to talk about, about uh, why, how I ever learned about this or got interested in this particular one. Uh, John G. Bing, he writes under the name of G. Uh, Bing. Yeah. Actually, his real name is Yubin. I have no idea why he does that. Uh, he is a, a professor of philosophy and also uh, the chancellor of the university, uh, the University of Nanjing in China. And he heads a, a group of uh, scholars of Marxism. And I, I, the way I understand his project, I'm sort of guessing here, but I think it's a good guess, is that the idea is that they want China to be the world leader of Marxist scholarship, right? That, is, that even though, by my opinion, China is a capitalist country run by billionaires, it still has an official philosophy of Marxism, the way the Soviet Union had an official philosophy of Marxism, and it is important that uh, Chinese scholars could get the reputation of the superior scholarship of this All right? So, uh, uh, Jan has written many articles and books, and I got interested in this by his writing a book on Lenin's personal notebooks when he studied Hegel, Lenin's notebooks on Hegel, which, if you're interested in Lenin's thought at all, it's an absolutely essential source. And the book, unfortunately, is so badly translated into English that it's like deciphering it to figure it out. But very good ideas in it, some of which are in this book that we read. Right? Uh, so uh, let's get started here. That Zhang has five interpretive models uh, specifically about Marx. This is not just news about Marxism. This is views about how to understand Marx, and in particular, how to understand his evolution over his lifetime as his view of change. So the first one is called Western Marxiology, and that's really, uh, well, we'll talk about that in more detail. Second one is a Marxist humanist model that favors the early Marx, still a popular point of view, I think. Uh, then there's Aldrich's rupture theory, and we'll just talk about that a little bit because we already talked about it. Uh, and then there's a Soviet view, for a long time he calls the evolutionary theory. Uh, and then uh, the, the uh, mentor of uh, Professor Jain was a man named uh, Sun Wokui, and he had a, a model he called the double turn model, right? That is, it's a, a rather complicated dialectical development he finds in Marx's thinking, particularly as complicated in the 1840s, right? So uh, <clears throat> the important issue in all these models are how Marx thought developed over time. Uh, and in some of them, it's important what was Marx's relationship to Engels, right? Some people will say Engels and Marx are completely different, and as an Engels are sort of a fraud here, right? He's, you're literally misrepresenting Marx. I know that sounds nuts, but that's the view. Okay, <clears throat> so let's start with Western Marxiology. Uh, this uh, opposes Marxism, but at least pretends to be neutral scholarship. And there's a couple of different kinds of this. One of them is uh, directly, a, well, probably they're all directly a product of the Cold War, but one of them is this, this created by American universities and by uh, the CIA, right? That is, uh, the CIA set up publishers who would publish the books uh, for people to do this in Marxiology who might not otherwise have been published, right? The, the main publisher that they set up is called Prager Publishers. I don't know if it still exists, but it published an awful lot of books over a lot of years. Uh, 
Also that in Europe you find a similar phenomenon, and I'm not sure exactly how they were organized, somewhat different. And also uh, Catholic intellectuals played a, a role in this, Jesuits and Dominicans. Uh, and uh, my, my experience is that some of the stuff by Jesuits, not particularly about Marx, but about per se Soviet philosophy, I find it quite valuable. Right? Because if you can't read Russian, you like to see a book that has a whole bunch of quotes from the Russian authors that you're trying to understand, right? So uh, it's not all worthless, it's not all so ideological that you couldn't benefit from it, some of it. So the main idea, however, is best in Marxiology, as as Zhang Yibing, Zhang Yibing sees it, is that there are two Marxists. There's the good humanist Marx, the youthful Marx. And there's the bad revolutionary who wrote Capital, right? So, uh, and they'll want to, and you know, Jay mentions this, but he doesn't give too many examples of it, that uh, <coughs> they'll want to use the young Marx as a sort of the platform which, from which to attack the mature Marx of that one. So we need to, to summarize the views of the two Marxes, and, uh, and that means I need to talk a little bit about Marx's views as a, as a young man, and in some ways it was regrettable not to have done this before we talked about Althusser, because I think after you see this, it'll be clearer that why Althusser might think this young Marx stuff is pretty bad and should we, you know, we should sort of read it out of Marxism, right? That it's more plausible to do that. So uh, <coughs> up to the mid 1840s. Marx was a leftist follower of Hegel, a German idealist. Right? Uh, Hegel thinks that uh, the, uh, what moves uh, human history is what he called mind or spirit, and that there's an absolute spirit, which sounds like it might be God that he has in mind there, his own idea of God, uh, is uh, uh, active in, uh, in human history. So uh, certainly that counts as an idealist too. Uh, but uh, in the 1840s, Marx was very impressed by one particular young Hegelian, a young you know, follower of Hegel, whose name was Ludwig Feuerbach. And Feuerbach wrote a book uh, giving a materialist critique of religion, uh, Feuerbach's variety of materialism, particular variety, and, uh, and you, but using Hegelian ideas to do it. So. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, what was the content of it. So by 1844, Marx advocated the emancipation of humanity. He wants to free humanity. Now, that's not a, a class notion. That doesn't say free the working class. It says free us all. Uh, and uh, he says that requires abolishing capitalism. So he's got to that conclusion. And then he believed that the work that the class that could accomplish the liberation of humanity was the proletariat or the working class. So that's Marx up to about 1844. So uh, the manuscripts that Marx wrote when he was in temporary exile in Paris in 1844, and where he was subject to many important influences, right? He met Engels there, and they clicked right away and agreed on many things. Marx also hung out with uh, some of the workers' secret societies in, Fran in France, and he, uh, he gave them credit for teaching him things, right? Uh, and uh, in it, the manuscripts that he wrote at that time were not published until the 1930s. So there were a sort of hidden dimension of Marx's thought, and the, their publication gave uh, a kind of a scholarly basis for the idea of the, the young Marx and a, and a different older Marx, because he his ideas are very filled out in the manuscripts, but never published. I mean, never published in his lifetime. So it's clear that um, uh, those manuscripts uh, have a conception of uh, human beings as under capitalism and subject to alienation. And I'll talk about what alienation is in a minute, and needing liberation from that. And uh, Marx thought that philosophy could lead the working class to liberation. So that 
the metaphor is that the, the head of this liberation movement is philosophy and the heart is the working class, right? So he still believes that essentially at this time, philosophy is a big deal, not just that it's interesting or entertaining, but that it can liberate mankind or help do that. So let's talk about what alienation means. Uh, very broadly, it means separation of what should not be a part. Sometimes it's used in economics just to mean sales or gifts, but a much more usable meaning in philosophy is some kind of inappropriate separation, a separation that shouldn't be. So uh, the special use of this by Hegel would mean that when people produce something that they don't recognize as their own product, but then which can do damage to them. And uh, I believe that Hegel really got this idea from by studying capitalist economics, by studying the market. So he'll say, the market is a human creation, right? It consists only of interactions among human beings. And that even though we might not now decide to be able to decide simply to abolish it, nonetheless, it's the result of human actions and decisions in the past. The market is us. But the market forces us to do things or prevents us from doing things, and that forcing and preventing can be quite harmful, right? That as a person can go bankrupt or they can starve because of the conditions in some particular market or other. So that the market then is an example of, a, of an alien force which was created by human beings but harms human beings. So, uh, the Feuerbach used this idea and in his critique of religion. So Feuerbach says, God is our creation. We have created God. We have created a, 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 an ideal or an imaginary entity. And we have done this by taking our, our understanding of human nature and leaving out all the faults and powerlessness and limitations that human beings would have. So produce an image of essentially a perfect human being, and then say this person has created the earth and lives in the sky, and etc. Right? But Feuerbach is opposed to religion. Right? He wants to abolish religion. He says, now religion confronts us, God confronts us, as an alien power, and if we could get rid of that alien power, we would move in a big step towards liberation. Uh, so this, the book that he wrote that came out in 1841, it's called The Essence of Christianity, was a kind of bombshell in Germany. And uh, many people who were you know, disaffected intellectuals there suddenly became Feuerbachians. And Marx and Engels were two of those people. Right? So they thought Feuerbach uh, was terrific for a long time. Eventually, Marx is going to reject Feuerbach, and the famous place where he does this is the, the very short statement, 11 short little paragraphs called the Thesis on Feuerbach. And the, the most famous thesis on Feuerbach is that philosophy has only interpreted the world in various ways, and the problem is to change it. And what those uh, theses on Feuerbach symbolize for Marx is his disaffection with philosophy. He ends up with a conclusion something like, philosophy is just another ideology. It's not going to change the world. Right? What we need to do is a, a powerful movement of humanity, or the working class in particular, that would liberate us. But you can't do that simply by doing philosophy. Maybe maybe philosophy doesn't even help. He didn't come to that conclusion, but he might have done it. <coughs> so, uh, so he, he disavows Feuerbach uh, eventually, but in the 1844 manuscripts, the ones he wrote in Paris, Marx still sounds like a Feuerbachian, but a Feuerbachian who has become very critical of Hegel, but is still using Hegel's uh, ideas, for example, alienation. So let's see how that works. <coughs> oh, does it work? Let me try that. Sorry. Does that work? Is that helpful? Okay, let's try it. So uh, Marx 
gives a uh, uh, gives an argument in the manifest in, in the in the 1844 manuscript, uh, which is based on his conception of alienation. Uh, some of it is very similar to Feuerbach, and some of it is more particular to Marx to a conception of human nature that Marx defends. Sometimes this conception is called species being or species essence. Uh, and that, uh, the, 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 well, we'll see what the crux of it is. First of all, we'll say, he argued, he argued that human beings are essentially free creative beings who need to express themselves by modifying reality. So uh, a, a way of understanding what this would mean, it's like saying every human being is essentially an artist. Right? We need to modify the world in the ways that we've either dreamed up ourselves or we are doing our, we're part of a collective thing that we agree that this is a common project that we will do and we're going to modify the world that way. This is the kind of people we are. We are not contemplators. We don't just stand there and watch things. We need to do things that change the world. Right? Just like if you've got some <clears throat> A little, a little answer, the hamster that runs around in the wheel, right? We're like hamsters, only we don't need to run around in the wheel. We need to do something to modify the world. And the way we modify the world would express not only our human nature, but our particular ideas and preferences. So he says, under capitalism, workers do not create freely, but only according to their employer's plans. So her doesn't... The, uh, generally, speak, generally speaking, the employer doesn't hire you just to be creative. <laughs> Every once in a while it happens, but that's not usually what happens. Right? So, so what workers produce makes the capitalist richer, more powerful, and more able to oppress workers. So you can see that's Hegel's alienation construction, right? Or, or Feuerbach's alienation construction, we create God and then religion oppresses us. So he says, workers then confront their own products as alien powers that dominate them. They confront their own products because the products become the property of the capitalist who takes them to the market and hopes to make money, and often does. And that enriched capitalist then is a, uh, because of the properties, the powers, excuse me, because of the pro the work, I can't seem to get that sense, but because of the products that the workers have created become stronger in the social conflict with workers. So <clears throat> here's a way of expressing this more abstractly maybe. That is, uh, the worker's actual life separates him from his own nature as a free creator. Because people have to work for a living. But they don't work to express themselves, they work to pay the bills. Uh, that means there's a kind of perversion of their nature that they have to undergo in order to, to survive, right? Their nature as creators. So this means that capitalism is actually contrary to human nature. Uh, and therefore, it shouldn't exist. So this is a kind of a moral argument, you see, right? If it's a moral argument that strongly depends on whether it started with the right conception of human nature. So uh, this means it's a humanistic point of view, right? It says, this is the kind of being we are, and the kind of being we are is essentially fundamentally mistreated by the system because it alienates us from our own nature. So then the question is, why would you think, or why would anybody who wasn't Marx think that he had the right conception of human nature? Right? Capitalists, are they going to agree? Certainly not. Right? The capitalists have and have had for a long time a conception of uh, basic human nature. It's usually called economic man. It says uh, uh, everybody wants to consume. Uh, they, want, they always want more. They don't care how much other people consume, but they don't want to work any more than they have to in order to get it. That's uh, homo economicus, right? Uh, so if, you're homo, if homo economicus is right, and I think this argument about 
capitalism is, in, is contrary to human nature is going to fail. In fact, for homo economicus, if every human being is sort of a natural bargain hunter, maybe capitalism is perfect for them, right? So uh, that it de the whole argument depends on a really debatable philosophical thesis that we are by nature free creative beings. So by 1847, when Marx and Engels had already begun to collaborate on works that were both economic and the political economy and some possible works, Marx came to the conclusion that this is, this is a dead end, right? But if, unless you can get everybody to believe your particular philosophy, you're not going to change the world. And he already thinks that philosophy is not going to do that, right? So the analysis that you'll see, say, in the Communist Manifesto is an economic and sociological analysis. It says this is how capitalism works. It hurts us, right? It has crises, it has low wages, it has starvation, it has a war. That's not a human nature argument, right? That's a, an economist or sociologist argument. And so that essentially what Marx and Engels are doing in the manifesto, in the manifesto they actually talk about this kind of alienation argument and they say that's not what we're doing. We're not moralists. We're not trying to tell you how the world ought to be. We're telling you how the world will be. Now, uh, myself, I think there still is a moralism in Marx. <laughs> but, but, the, but you have to realize he, he and Engels did say the opposite. So, uh, the concept of alienation, however, does not disappear from Marx's thinking. Uh, and uh, we'll see some examples of later that are, say, 10 or 12 years after the Communist Manifesto. He's still talking about alienation over and over again. And in the same terms that he talked about it in 1844, even though there is a change here, the change is not complete. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I think we actually did that already. <laughs> So let's talk about the so-called mature Marx. Uh, 1848 and 49 perhaps would be a good time, but other people have slightly different dates. You'll see when we get to the five views, there's a lot of, diff a lot of question about what dates mean what. So Marx went back to Germany in 1848, and he went there with the intention of organizing uh, the, the party that he already belonged to and had written the manifesto for, the Communist League of Germany, within uh, Germany. And he went to the city of Cologne, uh, Köln in German, right? And uh, he um, <clears throat> uh, founded a radical newspaper there called the New Rhenish Times. And that newspaper was actually quite successful. And it wrote to very left-wing articles not necessarily communist articles, although some of them perhaps were. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that his efforts to organize a communist movement in Cologne were not especially successful, right? Some, some success, not much. Uh, but the newspaper, for a while, was, uh, uh, was successful until it was shut down by the Prussian government censorship, right? So, which was inevitable, but they weren't going to allow that, right? So Marx uh, went into exile in England, which was actually the place where most of the of the of the revolutionaries from uh, from Germany and from Central Europe uh, ended up, right? Uh, uh, a relatively safe place that would be, you know, not be persecuted. If, well, maybe not. Uh, and he he lived there forever, and he wrote economic works in many volumes and. Uh, uh, that only one of those, well, no, two of those works was published in his lifetime. Uh, but uh, two more big volumes of capital were published after his left, death by Engels. And three more volumes of his uh, notes and arguments were published uh, called Theories of Surplus Value. And now we have m uh, many manuscripts uh, of the various drafts, which are very helpful in uh, trying to figure out how Marx arrived at the conclusions that he arrived at. And uh, it shows sort of more his internal thinking rather than just the public face of it. So he died in 1883 uh, after a long illness. 
So Engels gave a speech at his grave site. It's easy to find that on the internet if you want, but the main theme of it is that Marx was primarily a revolutionist. That's what he did in his life. So let's talk about the two stages. Uh, I think it's clear that Marx's politics and philosophy did change a lot in the mid-1840s, uh, right? So that much of the idea of two Marxists is correct, right? That uh, Marx changed his opinion about many important matters over a period of less than 10 years at any rate. Uh, and the differences are not difficult to find if you're just going to read the text, which we can't know. Uh, Western Marx theology uses the ideas from the younger Marx to attack the older one. And one of the things that it does is to try to argue that Marx and Engels had very significant disagreements over some matters, and particularly over the question of whether there is dialectical processes and developments in nature, nature itself, nature apart from whatever human beings might do to it. Because clearly that is Engels' view. So why make such a why make such a point about this question of whether Marx and Engels disagree? The reason is that in the Soviet version of Marxism, Engels' dialectics of nature played a very large role. Right? There was a long series of ideological battles in the Soviet Union after 1917. And by about 1930, they had arrived at their formulation of uh, Marxism, which became the standard for the whole world over the next decade or so. Everybody thought, if you're a Marxist, this is what you think. And Engels' uh, ideas about the dialectics of nature were one important element. So if, you could, if you're a, a guy who wants to pe get people to reject Marxism, probably your main interest in doing that is to get them to, re to, to reject the Soviet-style Marxism. And you have to say, well, Engels was basically a guy who deliberately distorted Marx and made him say what he didn't say. You can say that would be very helpful in the ideological conflict if you could persuade people of that. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, let's see, we did that. So, in, uh, let's then switch over to the Marxist humanist model. That's number two on Jenny Bin's list. And it says, the model says that there are, there are not two Marxists, there's just one. And it's the early one. Right? And it says that um, even though Marx might have not been so public about it in the periods after 1845, he was still always the, the humanist. And uh, th this is a view which uh, is particularly put forward by uh, a set of thinkers who would describe themselves as, uh, as part of Western Marxism. But it's, it's also, there's even a political party with this name. It's called the Marxist Humanist, right? And uh, the reason I know about it is because there's an economist who's in that party who I think is really a good guy, in economically speaking. His name is um, Kleeman, K-L-I-M-A-N. So, uh, but generally speaking, the, uh, the Marxist Humanist model was advocated by so-called Western Marxism. So we need to talk a little bit about the geography, the intellectual geography of Western Marxism. Uh, the most important figure was the earliest, uh, a Hungarian philosopher named Georgi Lukács. Uh, and he wrote, he developed an interpretation of Marx that relied heavily on Hegel's ideas. So usually Lukács is described as a Hegelian Marxist. And in fact, uh, uh, Lukács was developing his point of view before the 1844 manuscripts were available. And then when they became available, you could see, well, as late as 1844, Marx really sounded a lot like Lukács, pretty close, right? So uh, there were others who joined this uh, trend, intellectual trend or school of thought called Western Marxism. Uh, some others to mention, um, well, I mentioned three there, but the next slide will say more. Uh, Gramsci, who was an Italian communist activist. Uh, Herbert Marcuse, who was a German member of the, what is called the Frankfurt School, 
uh, the School of Social Research in uh, Frankfurt in Germany, and uh, uh, Marcuse had to flee the Nazis, as did the other members of that school, and they ended up in the United States. Uh, and then Jean-Paul Sartre was, was fit into this too as a, uh, a leftist, but certainly not in the Soviet style. So, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that the Western Marxisms are, are either not materialists or not clearly materialists. So, so let me give you an example. Lukács says, nature is a social category. Now what that means is, nature is whatever it is to us. Right? Nature is, uh, the, na the nature of nature <laughs> is uh, dictated by our relationship to it and what we think about it and how we interact with it. So materialists are going to deny that. They're going to say, materialists are saying nature is something in itself. And in fact, it was something in itself before there were any people. Right? So that, and in fact, we know quite about it, what it was like before there were any people. So I think it's fair to say that Lukács is not a materialist and he was strongly uh, contested by this by figures from the Soviet Union. In fact, in 19, he wrote this book in 1923, Lukács, in 1925. There are several Soviet writers who uh, make, the, make the attempt to uh, what we call rip him a new one, right? Kind of <laughs> really destroy him. Avram uh, Duburin is one of them. And the other is a man named Rudas, a uh, Hungarian, I, I forget his first name. Uh, they criticized Lukács' politics and his philosophy. Uh, and uh, Lukács is un one of the people who, who rejects Engels, right? He rejects that there's dialectics in nature. Generally speaking, Lukács, and this is true of some other people like Sartre, think that dialectics is only a, a of a human phenomenon. It has to be connected with human consciousness, with human thinking or human activity in order to be dialectic. So dialectic, we could look at nature dialectically, but nature couldn't be dialectic in its in itself. It couldn't be that natural processes proceed by contradiction. So you can see from my example last time where I give the example of lightning strikes as the result of the resolution of a contradiction. That point of view in that example would be that there is dialectics in nature. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Lukács also is a critique of the basin, a critic of the basin superstructure model. But so what he does is he assumes that the basin superstructure model should be interpreted is the, as productive forces determinism. Remember we talked about that, the, the more conservative sort of social democratic understanding of the basin superstructure model. And Lukács is very critical of that, and I think his, actually his points are correct. If, if the basin superstructure were what he said it was, then he would have refuted it, right? So, <clears throat> uh, this means I think, however, that Lukács is in effect re re rejecting the core, or one of the core pieces of Marxist historical materialism. Uh, so other Western Marxism uh, mentioned the Frankfurt School in Germany. Uh, the Frankfurt School is a combination of Marxism, Freud, and Hegelian idealism. And different thinkers in that school have different combinations. For example, for Marcuse, Marcuse's principal work is a combination of Marx and Freud, right? And uh, he continued to write that in the United States, and it was some influence, had some influence in the United States. I remember even in the in the student movement when I was a student activist in the 1960s, there were uh, uh, people who were uh, recommending uh, to each other, "Oh, we need to read this Mar Marcuse book, A One Dimensional Man," which. Frankly, I didn't agree with that one, but still, it was influential, okay? Uh, that um, other figures who were important were Horkheimer and Adorno, a guy named Fromm, who I think was a psych psychoanalyst, uh, and later on, a, a man named Jürgen Habermas, 
who was uh, an important influence in European political thought, I think, in the 60s and 70s. Right? Uh, Gramsci was an Italian communist leader, and uh, he, was, he was a fighter, right? He's not just an intellectual, which is not that being an intellectual is a bad thing, but fighting is good too if you're fighting for something good. So, uh, but his, his contribution here seems to have been that capitalists dominate more through a cultural hegemony, a domination, uh, an ideological domination of, uh, of the working class rather than a, a physical or forceful domination of it. So uh, my, my reaction to that is I, I remember years ago somebody told me the ruling class rules by a combination of force and fraud. And it's sometimes in some places force is more important <laughs> And sometimes you can fool people, right? So uh, if you just look at American history or Mexican history, you find examples of both kinds of things. I think. Right? So <clears throat> the rupture theory—we really already talked about this. I don't think we need to uh, do any more with it. Uh, but the basic idea here is that the real Marx is the one that emerges after 1845. And that uh, uh, Althusser imagines that the uh, that the real Marx completely rejected the earlier Marx, but uh, I've said before I took that it isn't true. But here's just a quotation that comes from 1857. This comes from one of the rough drafts of Capital that Marx worked on about that time. People usually call it the Grundrisse. Grundrisse is a German word which means roughly outline, right? Notes, right? Uh, so here's a quote, it says, the creative power of the worker's labor establishes itself as a power of capital and confronts him as an alien power. So I think that sentence could just as well have been written in 1844 manuscripts. In fact, there are sentences in the manuscript that are almost the same. So Marx did not give up this idea of alienation and of, uh, of the idea that labor under capital is like this, right? Labor under capitalism is a, is a kind of forced labor. It's not the kind of labor that human beings would do voluntarily if they didn't have to pay the bills. Yeah. So uh, then uh, number four is the model favored in the USSR. Uh, and um, it sees Marx's development as gradual progress of abandoning Hegel and also of overcoming Feuerbach, right? So we, that it's clear that Marx was enormously influenced by both of those people at different times, and they, well, they gradually gave it up. So the, the author that, that I read years ago when I was trying to figure out sort of Soviet philosophy more, it has exactly this view, right? That not that there is either an abrupt break like Althusser, or a uh, resolution of a dialectical contradiction and supersession in 1845 or so, it's just a gradual accumulation, not a dialectical view of it, or a, even a structural view of it. So then let's talk about uh, Sun Bokui's view. This is uh, Professor Zhang's uh, mentor, also a professor, who had already passed on by the time this book was written, but. It's clear that uh, that even if I suspect that Zhang has some disagreements with his professor, but I think he's re reluctant to say so. Right? Probably doesn't matter. So here's uh, a, a little bit of the structure of what uh, uh, Professor Sun called the double turn model. Right? So it says from 1837. To 1843, we have Hegelianism, Hegelian idealism, that's Marx's ideology. From uh, 1843 to 44 or 45, we have Feuerbachian humanist materialism and general communism. Now, by general communism, he means sort of a vague philosophical theory that we should all live together and share, but not necessarily trying to figure out how that would ever come about or how it would work in detail. So in 1845 on, then we have what is, uh, he calls scientific humanism. So we'll have to figure out what makes humanists scientific. Uh, 
And roughly speaking, it's a humanism based on realistic possibility of human liberation, which has been provided by modern economic development, right? That is, uh, there are ways in which technology uh, facilitates people having uh, uh, many more ways to make a living and a much less drudgery in their lives. And uh, so his idea is technology can facilitate liberation uh, in a situation where, for example, everybody's doing subsistence cultivation and they have to work from dawn to, to dusk every night just to, to put food on the table, that the degree of liberation that's possible in that situation would be much less than is possible with modern uh, means of production. That's his idea. Okay? And then he says there's a theoretical shift from idealism and humanism to a historical, factual, and economic reasoning, right? Sort of from idealism to a kind of social science, right? Uh, and in fact, he says, and I think this is an interesting part of Sun's idea, he says there's a dynamical oscillation. That is, that different parts of Marxist thinking seem to move toward his future at, at different rates, and some of these he would sort of move to a view we would adopt later, and then he would take it back again. And in order to see this, of course, you have to find absolutely everything that you wrote in those couple of years, and then try to trace it out and see what actual, what, what are the actual, if you think you can think of some steps of progress and some as regress, which ones are the progress and which ones are the regress. Right? So, uh, some of that material that does this <coughs> is in the book we're taking here from Jack, right? It's a really long book, but it's free. <laughs> okay. So these are uh, from Jang, some high points of Marx here. Uh, the 1844 manuscripts are the high points of his humanist social phenomenology. So roughly speaking, phenomenology means the way things seem to people, or the way they experience things, right? Uh, or the way that you describe how people uh, experience things or how it appears to them. So he says this is a, a, a social phenomenology of humanist labor alienation theory. Okay. Uh, and then the high point is uh, from early 45 to late 46, and we have a, a bunch of things written at the same time that have roughly the same view. We have the thesis on Feuerbach, the so-called book, well, there never was such a book. There's, there's a lot of pieces you can put that have been put together in that, and they're all written by Marx and Engels, and sometimes by a third party where it's hard to identify. Uh, important work, but to say it's a book is an exaggeration. Okay? Uh, and then a, a letter that Marx wrote in 1846 by a man named Anikov, a Russian guy, where he lays out a lot of very interesting stuff and wasn't part of our reading here, but it's, it's a good idea to look at it. Uh, and then uh, from 1847 to 58, he is uh, working on uh, the first draft of Capital, the so-called Grindrisset. And uh, it, in, in English, it's almost 900 pages long. Right? So it's enormous, not very well organized uh, manuscript. But it was finally published for the first time in any language, you know, I think in 1939. And then suddenly it became the thing that anybody who was interested in Marx scholarship had to read, right? It was published in English and Russian, and then it wasn't, I mean, it was in, in German and Russian. It wasn't translated into English until 1973, right? So a long time it, it took for the sort of crucial pieces of the, you know, the data for Marx scholarship to come before us. Um, and I, I know, um, well, some, I'm not sure how many, people who wrote their PhD thesis on some theme in the Grindelwald. And I'm, I'm saying some people, more than one person has done this. Probably dozens of people have done this in different parts of the world. So, uh, in Grindelwald, we don't have a humanist phenomenology. We have a historical phenomenology. That is, we're being historians and you know economic theorists, and we're seeing through 
seeing through, that is, seeing as illusions, reifications, fetishisms, and pseudo-phenomena. And I'm going to talk about what those things mean, right? So I'm not, not, not expecting people to say, oh, I know what that is, I know what fetishism is. But, uh, and making scientific explanations of the mode of production. Scientific, I mean, it's a very straightforward way, right? That is, you, you look at the economic data, you look at the historical development, you make the, just the kind of, of inferences from that information that a uh, you know, respectable and cautious social scientist would do. That's what Marx is doing. So some key words I will just mention, and we don't need to go deeply into any of these, but let's just make sure you're, oh my goodness, already done. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm, I'm still, I'm just going to take a quick minute here, okay? Uh, reification, and, and this is Marx's term, it's, it's not imposed on him, means treating a relationship as if it were a thing. And Marx's key example is um, treating capital as if it were a thing, as if it were a kind of stuff. Say that capital consists of machinery, for example. Marx says, no, capital is a social relationship. It's an exploitative social relationship in which some people get to uh, appropriate the, the creations of other people without paying for it. Um, so he says, reification is the process of, for example, treating capital as a physical substance that could be spread around the world and bought and sold, rather than as a social relation. Fetishism is also connected with the same example. Fetishism, Marx thinks, is a, a result of reification. So fetishism says uh, you're treating something as if it had magic powers, of uh, treating something, uh, some entity, as if it uh, could had the properties of a living thing. So, for example, you say money makes money. And Marx is going to back and says, that never happens. <laughs> money is not a self-reproducing substance. To make money, you invest in something, right? You might invest indirectly. You might just put your money in the savings bank. What does the bank do? The bank invests in some project, some business. In that business, they hire workers, and they pay them less than the full value of their work, and they get a profit, and they give the profit back in the form of interest to the banker, who gives a little bit of it back to you, right? So there's, uh, th there's no magic in this, but it's not obvious, right? It requires digging below the dirt to surface to find it. Uh, then also there are pseudo-phenomena, and what, is, uh, what uh, Zhang means by pseudo-phenomena is, for example, it sometimes appears as if the wage bargain, when if I go to work for an employer and he says, you know, this is the wage, and this is the benefits, and this is what you have to do, and then you know, we shake on it, say, and I go to work. It looks as if that's a, a sort of free decision, a contract between two hopefully rational agents who hope, each hope to get something out of this, but that's all there is to it. But Marx says that really, this is an exploitative relation. And one of us, at least, is compelled to do what we're doing, right? Because every worker has to have a job, right? Well, there are some other alternatives, they're not good ones, right? So you're compelled to make a bargain with somebody, although you're not compelled, usually, to pick a picker of a certain employer, although in some places there's only one choice. So, uh, let's just look at the final thing here, which I thought was kind of fun. Uh, that. Uh, Zhang thinks you can sort of talk about what is the logical form of the conclusion that Marx is drawing. And uh, I think there's something to this. Sometimes logicians, when they want to have the form of a statement, at least in English, they say it has the form S is P, where S is the subject and P is the predicate, right? Mm -hmm. So frogs are green, or my frog is green, is subject is predicate, right? So he says, in 1844, the logical form of Marx's conclusions was S ought to be P. Existence should be essence, or humans should be free, right? 
roughly speaking, a moral conclusion. Right? And then in the 45 to 48, he says, S realistically could be P, right? So we're not just doing philosophy now, we're making a hopefully rational empirical assessment. And we can say, for example, communism could win. Marx had that view, right? Uh, and then he says in 58 on, Marx is looking more at historical development, particularly of the capitalism in its different phases, and it says the form of this is, well, uh, S1 became S2, this is something that took place, and now S2 is becoming S3, and after that maybe it will become S4, so you're looking at the historical development of the processes in the capitalism. So now, my suggestion is, I don't think Marx ever gave up the first category, right? I think there's always in Marx an ethic of human liberation. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be put in the form of alienation, but people should be free. I think he's always committed to that. What he, but what he doesn't want to do is make his main argument based on that idea. So I guess that's what I have.